It's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And you know, I have two videos for you today, a global version and an XRP version. And this is the global version where I'm going to focus on what's impacting the global economy by ways of changes that are really underway. So we're going to look at the tightrope that we're walking on with this massive amount of debt. Also, I'm going to look at the traditional markets, what's pushing the fear button right now. And then the bottom line from the feds, that came from Jerome Powell in the last 24 hours in regards to the central bank digital currencies. And last, the most interesting statement from Brian Brooks yesterday. It's very perplexing. Really, it is. He is the acting controller of the currency. So there's some really, I don't know, I'm going to have you listen to it and make up your own mind because I'm really actually a little confused. But first, this is Lynette Zhang. I'm not sure if you know, but she's the chief market analyst at ITM Trading. She's been in that job since 2002, and she's been in the markets for quite some time. I think since back in 1964, she's been a banker. She's been a stockbroker. And she has uh, studied world currencies since 1987. I really like her. She's a gold bug and a silver bug. I, I, I think that if you haven't discovered her yet, this is kind of the timing that you want to listen to someone like this. She works with the founder's son, and they have 25-year history in the state of Arizona. Now, her video on Saturday had me and probably about 100,000 other people on pins and needles. There were two videos where she talked about her call to get into physical gold now, this is the point of when she was being so adamant about now. And it was because she felt that we were in a real danger zone on Monday with this 80 trillion that the banks had to reset. And the reset was this notional, the notional contracts. And the contracts, well, it went okay. This is where the banks were bracing for the debt that needed to be transitioned into a new rate. And well, 80 trillion is a lot. <laughs> so it created a high alert with this swap. So while the switch was expected uh, to boost longer term liquidity, I think it did, which is a really, really good thing. Uh, the concern, though, was that it would trigger a sale of tens of billions in debt. And you know, fear, fear is really you know, something that you have to pay attention to because uh, I understand when you have that sense of fear in a marketplace, it, it, it's an accurate call for red flags. So the whole process for this new push is a new standard that is coming in reference to the rate for the debt and the derivatives. This is all based on a secured overnight financing rate for the repos. And this is also called SOFR. Now, I don't know if you're interested, but if you are, you can go to the CM, uh, CME group website. Oh, I was going to bring you over to the actual um, American Banker article that talks about that big bang switch of 80 trillion worth of swaps. So if you are wanting to just uh, level up on your knowledge, the CME group has a four minute video on SOFR, uh, as well as some other courses. And when you finish the courses, you can take a quick quiz and with a couple of questions, then they give you this certificate of course completion. I don't know. It's, you know, it's, it's not anything big, but the education is very good. I just think, uh, yeah, it's a good resource that's at no cost. So even though the New York Stock Exchange shed 410 points, the U.S. stock futures rose slightly Monday evening. And I think all eyes are on Pelosi, who is trying to narrow the differences with Mnuchin for another stimulus package. The market wants another package, of course. So we're not out of the woods yet. 
the word from many economists is that this weight of the unforeseeable future uh, makes this whole timing very unsure regarding recovery. So globally, the panel for the cross-border payments with the head of the IMF, Kristalina Gordiva, this is really what was in the global markets in terms of news coverage in the last 24 hours. And I think it's because Jerome Powell was in the spotlight. And Jay attending this panel, well, I had hoped for kind of a candid discussion, but there was nothing of the sorts. So they all had obviously the questions given to them prior and they had prepared written answers that uh, they read out. At least the um, gentleman from Saudi Arabia and Jerome Powell, was, they were very much sticking to their script. Bottom line, the U.S. is more focused on getting it right than spending uh, not enough time to make sure that they are going about the central bank digital currencies correct. So speed to market is not what they're focused on. And I know they still have a lot to figure out. And Japan, the same. It's not as easy as you might think. There are three areas. Well, there's lots of concerns and problems they haven't really figured out yet. The three I keep hearing coming from the U.S., and I've been reading what the um, Accenture MIT examples uh, with their trials, what they are encountering, and, and, you know, how does it work offline? I know that seems maybe not important, but it really is, and they haven't figured it out yet. The other thing is, what would the role of the regional banks be? So if you do a retail version like, the, like has been done in China, Oh, what's the role of the smaller banks? And I know for China, it has been much easier for them to roll out and drop the helicopter money because they don't have a lot of bodies of, of uh, entities that are needing to be um, like all on the same page. Uh, China is really set up in terms of its governance like a pyramid from the top down. And and the United States just isn't so much like that, although I know the feds have a lot of power and they are very much at the top, but still they are not like the only one entity that can make a sole decision. Uh, there has to be kind of a consensus, if you will, with the United States. And the third thing is what technology is best suited for this? This is what the MIT uh, and um, Accenture trials are are really discussing and and you know when we look at all of the countries that have tested, sometimes it's Hyperledger, sometimes it is with the Quorum, sometimes it's R three. Um, of course, uh, Ripple has um, done some work with their Rails. So so there's a lot of technology solutions out there and it's just not so clear which one is the best and also we can't ignore cyber attacks you know this is a huge concern i want to show you what's dominating the news here in japan today wow look at that i bingo bingo i got right in the uh olympic ring there uh this this is I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm just telling you that this is what is uh, dominating all the headlines in Japan on Twitter and online. And I'm sure when I watch the news tonight, Russia targeted Tokyo Olympics for cyber attacks, according to the UK and the US. So their intel is coming up with uh, something. And I, I haven't looked into all the details, but if you do bring your currency online, this is something that you definitely uh, need to consider. All right. This is the part where Brian Brooks has me really, really shaking my head. Now, Crypto Poet, he did a really good job at capturing the whole um, event or, you know, I think it's the uh, DC. Hmm, what's what was the event called? The DC FinTech virtual experience 2020, something like that. Uh, so he he did catch it, but I'm going to show you this 
this portion on um, Twitter, which is who has this? I guess it is Julian Flash. And the reason why is because uh, Julian made it loop. And I want you to hear it twice because once is probably not enough. Listen twice here. And I have to give thanks, you know, to uh, Kriakopoulos because he gave me the heads up that this even was part. I, this occurred in the middle of the night when I was sleeping. So I, I didn't know about this. I only caught the uh, Brad Garlinghouse portion of this DC FinTech virtual experience. Okay, so I want you to listen because King Solomon responded and I'll read what he responded with after we listen to it. And then what do you think? Okay, here we go. Actually, anybody who's connected to the internet, and that, that's a good thing for stablecoins. And then ultimately, really, Chris, I think the real use case of, 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 of crypto is in a world of increasing integration and increasing globalization. It really makes no sense to think that anyone across borders who wants to transact with each other has to pay a foreign exchange fee to change change yen into dollars let's just say and then also to pay a money transmitter for the act of hitting the send button and sending that money across a proprietary platform imagine if there was a single token that was recognized on both sides of that divide and when you received it you could cash it out into your local currency and when i received it i could cash it out into my local currency without the need to change it right those kinds of things occupy so many trillions of dollars of friction in the system that it's when people say there's no killer app to crypto, I sort of think, no, 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 the, the killer app of crypto is the simplest application, which is avoiding frictions. That's what it's all about, much as the internet did for sending information. In fact, with anybody who's connected to the internet time. or map, that's a good thing for stablecoins. And then ultimately, really, Chris, I think the real use case of, 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 of crypto is in a world of increasing integration and increasing globalization, it really makes no sense to think that anyone across borders who wants to transact with each other has to pay a foreign exchange fee to change, change yen into dollars, let's just say, and then also to pay a money transmitter for the act of hitting the send button and sending that money across a proprietary platform. Imagine if there was a single token that was recognized on both sides of that divide. And when you received it, you could cash it out into your local currency. And when I received it, I could cash it out into my local currency without the need to change it, right? Those kinds of things occupy so many trillions of dollars of friction in the system that it's at, when people say there's no killer app to crypto, I sort of think, no, 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 the, the killer app of crypto is the simplest application, which is avoiding frictions. That's what it's all about, much as the internet did for sending information. So King Solomon writes that he's talking about a global interoperable stable coin, transferable without the need to bridge. And so he's either obtuse, which means like slow to learn or get it, or he doesn't understand what red tape would occur. occur and he heavily doubts that. And I do too, because Brian Brooks is really intelligent and up on his game or he's prepping the masses which aren't paying attention <laughs> i'm paying attention i know solomon you're paying attention and he thinks the latter is the most realistic meaning that he is talking about a global interoperable stable coin it sounds very much like something saga tried to launch, oh, I shouldn't say try, they did, but I don't know how popular it is. It is uh, backed by a basket of fiat currencies. And it also reminds me of Bancor. This is a world currency or a global, could be a global digital currency now that transacts internationally with no set borders. It was introduced in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference. And it was the idea or the brainchild of the economist John Maynard Keynes. And you could, uh, you could take gold and it could be exchanged for Bancor, but you could not take Bancor and exchange it to gold. So it just went one way. Individuals or the public could not hold it or trade it. All international trade was, in his mind, going to clear, do the clearment 
or the the settlements uh, in Bangor. And just listen to this one minute here. There was a competing proposal. So this picture is not so easy to see, but um, this is uh, an economist by the name of Keynes, which you've probably heard of uh, from the UK. And his, uh, his proposal was called Bancor. In fact, our work today is inspired by this proposal. And he said, um, listen, if we use a national currency as our global reserve currency, that might cause some problems. This country whose currency it is, is gonna be um, disproportionately powerful. They're gonna have disproportionate sway in the world. Everyone will want their currency. Their currency will be the most liquid of them all. Um, he envisioned a scenario where we decouple this global reserve from a specific nation. Of course, you've got to govern it, um, but this was the Bancor proposal in a nutshell. And at the time when he did propose it, the U.S. Uh, opposed it. And so it was ultimately not accepted. But gosh darn, it is sure sounding like this two-page article that appeared in The Economist magazine on January 9th, 1988. This was a prediction that at the time was considered outlandish. And on page 10, it wrote that it would probably start out as a cocktail of national currencies. And through time, national currencies would cease to matter because people would choose it for its convenience and stability of its purchase power. I don't know. Uh, you, you, your, your, your interpretation of what Brian Brooks said is, is going to be as good as mine. I happen to side with King Solomon because I think that's what he was talking about is a, a global stable coin, which is basically a global currency. So let me know what you think. And I'm going to pay attention and hopefully we can get some clarification from Mr. Brooks. Obviously, I'm jumping to the fluff. So there is a brand new burger that's being introduced in Japan and it's called the fake burger. Yeah, it's that's really what it's going to be called. They're, they're not telling anyone what it is yet. So that's a way to have the marketing get a little bit stirred up. I have a guess from the pixelized picture. I'm going to guess it's egg. You know, Japanese love eggs. And uh, this is, my guess is going to be kind of an egg burger. <laughs> I don't know. We won't see it until the 23rd, which is on Friday. I don't have a Burger King near me. Uh, so I'm going to have to look online. We'll, do, we'll check it out again. And this is what it looks like in Ishikawa right now in, in these stair-stepped rice paddies in that part of the world. This is on the um, west side of Japan, on the back side. Sometimes people refer to it as. And it's got the uh, Sea of Japan there, which is uh, on Toyoma to Yama Bay. This is, I think, I think it's the largest bay in Japan, if I remember reading that right. And this is a kind of a sunshot, a sun, sunset shot, which is beautiful, but this is what is really beautiful, is the nighttime views when they light up all these solar powered LED lights and they do them in different colors. There's 30,000 lights. And, you know, it's just one of those seasonal things that this particular part of Japan does. And also on that side of the country, there are some really stunning traditional gardens because it's near Kanazawa. And this is like the little Kyoto of that area. And this is actually near the Okayama castle but this is just beautiful right and i just am so amazed at some of the really stunning photography that i run into and there is a way now that you can actually if you are an artist or a photographer uh, you can digitize your art into a non-fungible token and there's 
websites now that you can actually do that with. And this is one called Mintbase. This is just getting so interesting, this space. So I am always looking for ways that in this new changing world, you can reinvent yourself. So if you are an artist or a photographer, this might be something for you. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in the next video because um, there's an NFT that sold out like within hours here. And I'm going to talk about it in the next fluff. And it, I was just not really paying attention to this part of the space until I saw that interview or the, well, Brad Garlinghouse interviewed Michael Arrington. Uh, and he talked about this being the next, the next, next new big thing. So I'm starting to pay more attention to it. All right, everybody do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.